as the population increased in size, as there were more interactions between individuals, the change that took place was not so much in the character of the deviance of behavior, but in the fact that a larger and larger percentage of the total population exhibited deviance in behavior that was not of survival value to the group. That is, they reached a time when most of the females never developed the ability to care for their young, to build nests, and, and so forth. And most of the males had extremely deviant sexual behavior, homosexual or pansexual, where the sex activity is directed towards any rat indiscriminately. Uh, one of the things which we might call deviance is merely a withdrawal. Now, on a theoretical basis, when the interacting group reaches the square of the optimum, every individual will be totally withdrawn, and no animal will be aware of the presence of any others, even though they're packed close together. And I think this is the the general conclusion which may have application to the human scene. Twenty-five percent of the residents of Midtown Manhattan are severely impaired or incapacitated by mental illness. Fifty-eight percent exhibit varying degrees of pathology. Less than one in five is mentally well. These are the results of the most thorough analysis of mental health in New York City. The Midtown Manhattan study was published in 1962 after eight years of research by psychiatrists at the Cornell University Medical College. Well, we were kind of refugees from New York. We suddenly found that we were being surrounded by uh, murders, robberies, uh, rapes, shootings, etc. And it became pretty scary living uh, within this milieu. And uh, we came out to Beverly Glen in Los Angeles, which we found. Uh, seeking that kind of feeling of community and uh, combined with openness and, and countryside, which had uh, seemed to fit our bill. And uh, it's on its way out now. Uh, the oak groves, which the kids have had a chance to play in, and uh, is, has gone to be replaced by four houses. Uh, we came out here and uh, looking for some peace and quiet and a lot of people who we can relate to within our community and uh, now find uh, that this is all disappearing uh, with uh, another kind of raping, the raping of the hills. Mega what? Megalopolis. Well, I'd say it's one large city from Boston to Washington. Super city? It's rather crowded and dirty. Chicago to Detroit? <laughs> 200 miles of confusion. <laughs> All the way from Cleveland to Buffalo. It's like everybody crammed in along the coast, right? It ain't gonna rip apart my neighborhood. And over on transportation reappraisal. California's growing by half a million people each year. This is the captain speaking. We're holding over Hartford. I flew out flying from Philadelphia to Boston. Twinkle lights all the way, and it was absolutely fantastic. When the lights go up, crime goes down. 30 million of us in the metropolitan New York by 2005. Is that what it's coming to? Spread City. Monopolis, but who is he? Sounds like something from Batman. God can only bless people when they live on the farm. Megalopolis. I like it here. I like the beach the best of L.A. because you get away from all this traffic and all the noise. And here you can be with nature and the birds and you can just look out into the ocean and just be able to feel yourself.
And when there are 100 million more of us by the year 2000, will our cities be sicker still, our suburbs just as sick, our landscape further befouled? That's likely to be so, mate. And the reason is simple. We are a man-centered society. We have never learned that we are a part of nature. Show me any civilization that believes that reality exists only because man can perceive it, that the cosmos was erected to support man on its pinnacle, the man exclusively is divine, and then I will predict the nature of its cities and its landscape. The hot dog stands, the neon shill, the ticky tacky houses, the sterile core, the mind and ravaged countryside. This is the image of anthropocentric man. He seeks not unity with nature, but conquest. Yet unity he finds. When his arrogance and ignorance are still, and he lies dead under the greensward. Among us, it is widely believed the world consists solely of a dialogue between men, or men and God, while nature is a faintly decorative backdrop to the human play called progress of profit. If nature receives attention, then it is only for the purpose of conquest or even better exploitation. For the latter not only accomplishes the first objective, but provides a financial reward for the conqueror. We have but one explicit model of the world, and that is built upon economics. The present face of the land of the free is its clearest testimony, even as the gross national product is the proof of its success. Money is our measure, convenience is its cohort, the short term is its span, and the devil may take the hindmost is a morality. 89% of America's redwood acreage is gone. Of that which remains, 28% is protected in state and national parks. This is 3% of our original redwood forests. America's all-year playground, South Lake Tahoe, California. Place to live and relax here in the High Sierra. We are keeping things jumping here at Tahoe. Thing as you consider the purchase of property at Lake Tahoe. People with extra particular tastes want in their surroundings. No money down on GI Bill. Features conveniences including two swimming pools. Oh, take Highway 50 to Tahoe Keys Boulevard. Then I know you won't want to miss it. Move your family into a new home, a beautiful home, a Sierra Heights home. Highway 50 in State Line. Topaz is available with a fireplace. One of the biggest shows ever to hit Tahoe. And financing especially easy. Main play and stay in luxury at Incline Village. Complete GE built-in appliances. There are no assessments against the Sierra Heights homeowner. Procrastinate no longer. Or for full details on quality living, check at the sales office open. You'll find your particular Shangri-La. Seven last go. Seven away. Six easy way, six soft easy, six easy. We anticipate that the traffic in this area will be four to five times the present traffic by 1985. And we have plans for uh, improving Route 50 to freeway standards. Seems to me that if the state government or the federal government want to expand Highway 50 into Lake Tahoe Basin, then they must do this. They must declare to the governmental authority here you will have your highway only if and when you have shown us on paper and through the appropriate governmental structure which can back up what you propose to do that you can control growth and development in Lake Tahoe. Development is now, growth and development are essentially out of control at this point. I mean, let's think what we're talking about here. It's what Mark Twain called the fairest picture the whole earth affords. We are talking about one of the great resources of the world, a very fragile, magnificent, alpine work of God. God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. Whatever the origins of Western man's attitude to nature, this is explicitly defined in Genesis. Man is exclusively divine, given dominion and enjoined to subdue the earth. 
The attribution of divinity to man alone denied divinity to nature. Nature and nature gods were seen as a threat to the primacy of Jehovah. This insistence upon mastery and conquest encourages man's most destructive instincts. When this is understood, then the depredations and the despoliation are comprehensible. This is a result of pollution in Lake Tahoe. Uh, destructive building practices uh, expose the soil on the hillside slopes to the rainfall in the spring, the melt in the spring, and that melt washes the nutrients from the soil that's been disturbed. The forest ordinarily being a very efficient recycler of these nutrient materials. It washes into the lake and that's the result right there. That is the forest, or that used to be the forest. That used to be the soil up on the slopes of the hills around here before they were bulldozed away. The very sust substance of the forest soil has washed down into the lake. Now you see it in the form of algae. Lake Tahoe is one of the two or three clearest lakes in the entire world. Lake Baikal in Russia, Crater Lake in Oregon are comparable. And it could be turned pea green within a lifetime. The Indians of the Taos Pueblo in New Mexico have been drinking water from Taos Pueblo Creek for over 700 years. It is not polluted. To them, the creek and all the land surrounding it are sacred. Our heart bleeds, make us sad when we see dead trees, dead flowers, dead grass. But when we see green stuff, green leaves make us happy. I, I, I would uh, say in a big way that I'm more happier in the, here than I would in, even down in Santa Fe. I spent number of years away from home and I never was completely happy like I am. I feel like I'm I'm in an open I'm open for just about anything. If my life is very simple, very easy. And just to live a hundred years. That's the way I feel. You know. The mountain itself we speak to it just like anybody would go to a church and have a say so, a prayer, give thanks, or ask for more things to, uh, for the next year uh, or at the present. Pray to the mountain spirit, which would be our protector for all sorts of everyday life or for the future and the past. Beyond the sacred mountain lies Blue Lake, the source of Taos Creek, the source, the Indians believe, of life itself. Now they conduct their ancient ceremonies of worship amid the white man's beer cans and the stumps of their sacred trees. The U.S. Forest Service has managed this land since it was taken from the Indians in 1906. The Pueblo is asking Congress to give it back. <laughs> Governor of Taos Pueblo, Mr. Carino Romero, make this statement to the American public that what is the meaning of the Blue Lake? Blue Lake is a shrine and is a lake and is a church. This lake is where our God and where our uh, saint is living. This is made by God and nature and surrounded by big, big mountain all the way around and facing east towards the direction that this sun is rises. And it's the, uh, surrounded by the living evergreen trees. And these are the living symbols of worship. These are living symbols of saints to us. 
And now we don't have no right to, to go and play the, like the cathedral in New York City. We have no right to go over there and to find a recreation spot. I was born with mountains just behind my home, not quite as beautiful as yours, but still they were very, very beautiful to me. Mm -hmm. And I think this sense of responding to the mountains and the sky, to the sea, and to trees, forests, birds, and so on, was absolutely basic to all people. And it certainly was uh, the view which was widely held, oh, certainly 2,000 years ago in the West, that the yes. people believed that the, the man and nature were one thing, there was no division, and that acts to nature were sacramental acts, as you believe today. Yes. But this tradition has been lost in the West. Judaism believed in uh, one God in whose image was man made and that uh, man was in fact given dominion over all life and non-life and he was in fact required to subdue the earth which is very different from living living in it and being of it. Christianity simply absorbed the same stories of Jews and uh, this attitude of man dominant was incorporated into the whole Western tradition. And by the Middle Ages, uh, you could see this. It was actually visible in the cities, the churches, the gardens, and the landscape. There was a walled church, a walled garden, and a walled city. The inside of the city was the city of godly man, and then inside this was a walled garden. And nature was outside the city. Nature was thought to be bestial and carnal, and uh, a temptation to man. The great period of growth, of course, in, in European history was the Renaissance. And, uh, at that point, uh, suddenly men were empowered really to make a profound effect upon the land. And of all the symbols that you can see which reflect that attitude to the land, the garden probably is the clearest. Because a garden doesn't really have any particularly important function. It simply is a device by which you can express your attitude to nature. Well, the very epitome of the Renaissance view is represented by Versailles and Beau le Vicomte. Here you have nature laid down like an embroidery pattern. as the idea of nature as wallpaper the imposition of a simple Euclidean geometry upon nature. There are these axes, a mile and a half long, half a mile wide. Nature reduced to a sea of gravel and sand and tractable plants, arranged with cookie shapers. Just so long as you say a beautiful thing and not a metaphysical symbol, you can't complain about it. If you say it's a lovely garden, fine. There's nothing wrong with arranging some plants. But if this is a view of nature, and you assume that you absolutely will make nature in this image, and you're confronted with an entirely new continent, you're a conquistador, you're a conqueror. You come then to the spoil. And so this is what the colonists were. These were men who came, believing nature to be hostile, nature is something to be, to be conquered, as we believe space today is to be conquered, or the ocean is to be conquered. And so they came and they, they accomplished their works by destroying this hostile nature. They cut down forests, not because they wanted the timber, they cut it down because they were frightened of the trees. They were frightened of the ghosts within the trees, the evil spirits within the trees. They cut this thing down, they destroyed it. They wanted to make a pastoral image. They wanted to tame nature uh, in order to demonstrate their exclusive divinity and their God-given license to express this domination and, and subjugation. Now, within all of this, one of the most astonishing things happened. Uh, the English, and I, when I speak about the English, I'm very objective because the Scots and the English have had an ancient antagonism. The, uh, in England at this time, uh, the agriculture was probably as backward as, as in Europe. Uh, the whole country was denuded of forests, and uh, this was simply a poor, poor, backward country. And uh, at that time, strangely enough, there came to be some Englishmen who believed it was possible to have a harmony between men and nature. In the 18th century in England, a very small handful of men, half a dozen of them, took this idea of a harmony of nature, re-enclosed the lands, reforested the lands, and made uh, probably the most beautiful and productive landscape that's ever been made consciously by men in the whole Western tradition. Horace Walpole said, that these men, these landscape architects, left the wall, the garden wall, left the wall and found all nature to be a garden. Well, the tragedy of the 18th century was that there wasn't even enough in England to stay the tide of industrialization. And this, of course, this enormous power wedded to the instinct to uh, dominate and subjugate nature was simply transferred across the Atlantic and uh, with greater powers and this 
vast continent, man's inordinate capacity to uglify and destroy, was given full license, and uh, we have seen the, seen the result. Los Angeles has less park acreage per capita than any urban region in the nation. Three to four acres per 1,000 population. Urban planners recommend 30. A study of metropolitan open space commissioned by the California legislature has recommended that entire city blocks be bulldozed to create new parks. Since its release in 1966, power lines, freeways, and parking lots have continued to intrude on the existing parks. A city council decision to allow a veterans hospital in Hazard Park, which serves one of the poorest sections of Los Angeles, is being challenged in the State Court of Appeals. When the parks are gone, then what? Then Forest Lawn takes care of everything, undertaking and cemetery in one place. Forest Lawn Memorial Parks, Glendale, Hollywood Hills, Cypress, and Covina Hills. I think you'd probably select the Jersey Shore as a supreme example of development based upon ignorance, greed, and malice. On the New Jersey Shore alone, the Great Atlantic Storm of 1962 caused $80 million damage, destroyed 2,400 homes, and left 28 dead. We carried $35,000 insurance on the uh, building we lost. But because it was damaged by seawater, which they're not liable for, they settled for 1% of $350. I couldn't believe it for some time. But, uh, I mean, many people suffer reverses, and you just can't lay down and quit. And, and we looked around, and we didn't want to go anywhere else. So we rebuilt here, and this is our home. It's like people along the rivers that flood and get washed out, or uh, they go back. It's like the lemmings, I guess, that run over the cliff and commit suicide. <laughs> if people here had only understood that the sand dunes were the protection against the sea, this would never have happened. But they bulldozed the dunes, and what resulted was disaster. And when there's another big storm, it will happen again. And so, all this is the inevitable result of the vast powers of the Industrial Revolution wedded to Western man's presumption of dominion over nature. 
You see, it's not a problem of uglification at all. In a very real sense, it's a problem of survival. But all this need not be. After all, it was the natural sciences which powered the great efflorescence of technology and all the despoliation it has brought. Let us simply use the same sciences to understand and respect nature, to learn the degree to which we can safely intervene with our environment. This is what the science of ecology is. It is a study of how all the elements of a natural world relate to each other, all the physical and biological world which includes man. So we can say, if we really want a life of maximum fulfillment, then let's scrap our old value system based on ignorance and economics and adopt a new relation with nature based on ecology. Let us ask nature herself what lands we can develop and what we must leave untouched. Now, on the Jersey Shore, the ecology is very simple. The hard part is finding the place where you can see the expression of it. We've got to go to a state park, which is one of the few places they haven't fouled up. You see, in order to survive here, you've got to understand about the sea, about sand, about wind, about vegetation, and about groundwater. Without this understanding, you, you simply can't survive in this environment. Now, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marvelous one because it is really so finely so simple that there is a sea, and then there is the, uh, this intertidal zone, there is the beach, Generally, there is a primary dune on which we stand. Beyond the, uh, a, a succession of secondary dunes, and then beyond that, the back dune, and still follow the bay. And every one of these are quite specific environments, and each of them have specific tolerances. Uh, the sea is marvelous. It can stand any amount of use, assuming no pollution. Uh, no bathers, no, no number of bathers uh, diminish the value of the sea. The same is true of the beach. The beach is remarkably tolerant. It can take the most intensive use without any destruction at all. But the minute one gets to the dunes and the vegetation, suddenly you find a, a zone of absolute intolerance. You see, the roots of the grasses intertwine to form a dense mat which stabilizes the dune against the wind and the sea, and the leaves entrap the grains of sand, and that's how the dune grows. If the grasses are removed or trampled, the sea and the wind will simply erode away the primary dune and the environments which it protects will be vulnerable. So the dune is intolerant to walking, much less development. Now beyond the dune is a trough, and here limited development might occur. The trough is protected from salinity, wind, and driving sand. Plants can exist here, so the environment is more stable and more tolerant. But if you remove the plants or kill them, it is no longer stable. And the best way to kill them is to remove the groundwater. So that means no shallow wells, only deep wells. And beyond the trough are secondary dunes, which are the secondary defense against the sea, so we leave them alone. But then we come to the back dune, and this is tolerant, like the trough, only more so. There is more protection, abundant fresh water, therefore more diverse vegetation, therefore increased, increased stability. And it's furthest removed from storm and floods. So this is where most of the people should live. And beyond the back dune is a bay, where we find shellfish in the breeding grounds of fish and wildfowl and where we shall not dump our garbage. And so here, from this very, very simple ecological understanding, uh, we can see the way in which man can live by the sea and enjoy the special fruits of the edge of the ocean. Now, the tragedy of all this is that it is kindergarten stuff in Holland where life depends upon the sea, but in this country, this knowledge doesn't reside in the intelligentsia, far less a political process. As a planning tool, ecology can be applied to any area a suburb or a continent, the principle remains the same, and it has little to do with subjective considerations of beauty or the arbitrary conservationist devices of green belts, wedges, or corridors. It is simply to preserve those lands where development would be a threat to man or where nature does work for man. But this is something we seldom do. If Western civilization has an inherent disrespect for nature, the abuses are encouraged by the political institution Americans prize most, local government. Our New England town meeting heritage has dictated that the cities and towns shall control the use of their land and that they shall tax it as the source of their revenue. There is more tax money in a house than in a tree. It is these pressures and those of normal population growth that threaten to overrun the Green Spring and Worthington Valleys in Baltimore County. Well, the Green Spring Valley is only nine or ten miles from the city hall of Baltimore City. And yet we can live out here in the open country where we can just enjoy our own little two acres. And when I come home at night, I always drive down the entire length of the valley, although it means extra time and extra distance. The 
pressures of the world just seem to, to vanish. Well, the valleys are obviously threatened by the fact that if you look at a map, you'll see that, that the valleys areas of 70 square miles are sort of in the middle of a V. And there's a radial that goes out this way from Baltimore and a radial that goes out that way. And there's industry here and industry there. And of course, you've got people driving back and forth to get to where they work. Well, ultimately, these pressures are going to go right through the bottom of that V and come right smack out into the middle of the valleys. And I'm afraid that when that happens, if there's no plan, no orderly plan of growth, we're going to lose what we have. And it would be really a tremendous tragedy because we can accommodate this growth that we have and still retain a tremendous portion of the natural beauty. A population of, um, I think, 15,000 could reasonably be expected to go to about 80,000 by 1980 and to 110 or 120,000 by the year 2000. And so we have some idea of the dimensions of the problem. The zoning controls which exist at the moment in the 70 square miles, uh, one house per acre generally would have been built throughout, and it would have simply inexorably spread its way over the plateau, into the valleys, up the wooded slopes, expunging all of this testimony to, uh, you know, two centuries of good husbandry, to wise land management, expunged it all and simply replaced it with a ticky-tacky of hot dog stands and gas stations and diners and billboards and sagging wire and split levels and ranchers, a testimony to greed, stupidity, and an inordinate capacity to destroy, and the total atrophy of any creative skills. And this, of course, was their inevitable destiny. Why should they be spared? The rest of Baltimore County has succumbed, just as the rest of the country has, to the horrors of typical suburban development, the same dreadful cycle which begins when farmers find it more profitable to sell land and crops. At the present time, we have uh, 39 acres here of prunes and walnuts, and uh, the taxes is getting to the point where it's not uh, possible to farm the land uh, as one should. We hope that uh, we can get this mobile park home built. Uh, by all financial reports, it's one of your best uh, incomes on your dollar value today. Uh, you have to convert your property into something else. Either that or sell to a developer. Developer. We expect that we'll eventually see here about 2,500 dwelling units of all kinds, single family, cluster, multiple, that sort of thing. Which is a two bedroom, a den, and two baths. Uh, what school district are the children in in this area? Uh, in the uh, Morgan uh, Hill School District. We are anticipating uh, in the immediate future uh, the construction of a new 12 to 13 or possibly 14 million dollar high school. We have faced increased uh, uh, costs in our police department service, uh, in our fire department service, uh, in our school construction costs. And in my opinion, uh, the only way that the town of Burlington can possibly negate uh, the influence of this type of spiraling cost in government today is to just go out and attract or, attract or induce or entice as much clean and desirable industry into the town of Burlington as we possibly can. California is going to be hard pressed to meet its the demands on its agriculture by 1975. After that, we don't know what. Already, because of developments like this one, uh, the quality of m many of our foods has gone down. And about five years ago, every subdivider in Baltimore County was eyeing them enviously. It was as if there was a Homestead Act about to be signed the whole bloody lot of them were just waiting for somebody to sound a pistol and they would come into this area and smear it. Already, because of developments like this one, uh, we have lost a great deal of natural beauty uh, in, our, in and around our urban areas in California. And they would expunge inexorably every piece of beauty you can see before you. And of course, inevitably, they go to the valleys first, because valleys are remarkably easy to develop. With the least of all possible investments, you can accomplish the greatest vulgarization and the greatest spoliation. You can accomplish the least profits for the least number of people with a maximum social loss. Already, because of developments like this one, and of course, many others, worse than this one, uh, California has, has squandered a fifth 
of its prime agricultural land since World War II. Well, listening to what you were saying, Mr. Heller, uh, it, uh, it seems rather strange. Uh, we're in the business of uh, building residential communities, and we think we've done a reasonable job here. The public response has been quite good. It seems a very right and proper place to live, and you're almost suggesting that uh, we never should have touched it. It should have stayed in agricultural use uh, when the, the response in terms of uh, public acceptance has been quite good. Why shouldn't we build a community here? Uh, look, uh, you're damn right if I'm suggesting that uh, it shouldn't be done here. But I, I lay the blame entirely on the public agencies which determine land use policy. We cannot rely on local government to to preserve our, our finest uh, natural assets. It is a lesson that the state of Hawaii learned, incidentally, um, uh, when it adopted in 1960 its land use law, which withdrew from local government the power to zone lands. And the state of Hawaii uh, took the zoning power on itself, and one of the things they did was to designate all lands in the state uh, which should be preserved for agriculture. When you start talking about something like this, you come pretty close to home in this area anyway, the notion of home rule, where uh, people want locally to govern themselves, and they're very fearful of giving up some of that power to even a regional governmental level. Well, it seems to me that you're just suggesting that we, we substitute one resource for another. The resource, is, uh, as a matter of fact, is not really it's not really agriculture, after all, it's land. And we're talking simply about the use to which land should be put. You're suggesting agriculture, I'm suggesting residential development. And we get into a subjective discussion of whether your use is better or mine is better. No, it is not subjective, my friend. Prime agricultural lands are objectively definable, and they are rare. It can take thousands of years for nature to create one inch of topsoil, and some continents don't even have any. In a world where millions are starving today and millions more will starve tomorrow, it is the most profound stupidity to sterilize these irreplaceable resources. Let me ask the, the obvious question then, uh, if not here, where? The question was, there have got to be 110,000 people accommodated in this area of 70 square miles. How do you best develop it? We've studied the bedrock geology and groundwater resources and physiography, the various streams, the floodplains, and uh, we came to some general conclusions about the degree to which the land, in fact, could absorb growth, welcome growth, and those areas where, in fact, development involved penalties both to the, uh, to the land developer and to society at large. We found that uh, the valleys were coterminous with the most important groundwater resource in the whole Baltimore region. So we could say as a proposition, uh, unless you want to make dysentery, diarrhea, hepatitis, and cholera a way of life, unless you would like to make your metaphysical symbol toilet paper, then uh, uh, don't develop in the valleys. Because clearly this is an inordinate hazard to health. This is a major resource of groundwater for the entire community. And by such development with septic tanks, you will uh, simply pollute all of the wells. And everybody here, of course, use, uses wells. But of course, there are other ways of uh, developing valleys. You can introduce sewers, but sewers, of course, all also lose water. And one can say that uh, modern sewers are only a more advanced technological method by which you can pollute groundwater resources. So <clears throat> we then came to the conclusion that the valleys were, in fact, not propitious for development. So we said, what is the capacity of the, the wooded slope to absorb development? And we concluded that these forests of this age, this, this mixed deciduous forest, actually probably could absorb about one house per three acres. Uh, and still uh, look like a forest. It, would, it wouldn't look like a broken tooth forest. Where then can 110,000 people go? We found that between the valleys there were plateaus, and that the plateaus were anodinous. So we found that there were, of course, no groundwater resources of any importance at all, that uh, floodplains were absent, uh, that there were no soils which were unsuitable for development with septic tanks, and moreover, uh, this area was far and away the easiest of all to uh, serve with sewers. And so we came to the general conclusion that the bulk of development should occur on the plateau. So instead of the idea of having simply uh, diffused uh, suburbanization uh, occurring throughout, we uh, suggested there be areas which were inordinately propitious for communities of different sizes. The valleys would remain in open space in perpetuity, uh, the wooded slopes with very, very low density development, and the bulk of the population located in, I think, 30-odd uh, communities uh, existing in clusters within the forest and the plateau.
I think everybody's realistic and recognizes that uh, by the year 2000, we're going to have to take care of about 150,000 people. And this plan will do it. And we will still, at the same time, uh, remain uh, the Green Spring Valleys, and we will remain uh, as part of the uh, beauties will be here. But I, I think that the... And the people will be accommodated and the institutions and the commercial needs of the area. The American dream. Squatters' rights in the shade of the trees. A cozy hearth in suburbia, where the trees and the fields become backyards for barbecues and front lawns to mow. No place, USA. To prevent this, some people may choose row or clustered houses surrounded by networks of open space, as the plan for the valleys and this Santa Clara development will provide. This, of course, is the homeowner's choice. The more important question is, should it be simply the developer's choice that determines what land is urbanized in the first place? Should the profit motive prevail when the land in question is an important resource if it maintains quality water for a county or quality food for a nation? The laws, by and large, say yes. Neither Maryland nor California has any effective policy for identifying land as a public asset and preserving it. The laws treat land not as an irreplaceable resource, but as a private possession to be junked at will. This is a great and glorious region. It is fishing with lakes. It is uh, transected by three great rivers, the Mississippi, the Minnesota, and the St. Croix. There isn't any doubt about the value of these. There isn't any doubt about their beauty either. Is it inevitable that they have to attract all the crummiest, dreariest, most disgusting and ugly industries and uses? Do they have to be the inevitable repositories of dumps, garbage, rubbish, you know, the most scabrous industries? Do we have to turn our backsides to rivers? You see, the Seine is a commercial river, and the Seine goes through Paris, and the Seine remains a commercial river through Paris, and the Seine is beautiful through Paris. Almost. Every land use uh, can exist adjacent to a river in uh, a noble way. But you have to then ins insist in the first case that the river is noble and the land use be deferential to the river. There isn't any reason why industry and commerce cannot, in fact, impinge upon the river, but do this with some deference. This pumps uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and when we're through with it, We'll have a beautiful industrial area of 1,100 acres of land all out of the river from a pipe. This is the type of work we're trying to do to create new dollars, new wealth, new information for St. Paul to make it a new productive city to take care of the growth that we see for the 1970s and 1980s. We will expect this land area to be filled up in the 1970s, and where we go from there, we may have to take it out of the river again. I'm sure that one can find sites which are better suited for industry. We determined that lakes in general, and this one in particular, were not suitable for industry. Here, obviously, is a resource being spoiled. Can we start again and ask, where is there a place intrinsically suited for industry? So that we can have the best of both worlds. Lakes for all the delights that lakes can give, and it is best suited for industry. Like most metropolitan areas, Minneapolis and St. Paul have developed with more respect for economics than for nature. But unlike most areas, they have begun to question how they can absorb their future millions without destroying the quality of their environment. In a rare move in urban America, the Twin Cities and seven counties have formed a metropolitan council to deal with problems which concern the entire region. The council commissioned the first ecological study to be undertaken for a metropolitan area. I have spent years of my life offering my palpitating hearts to various people who couldn't care less. And by and large, uh, you know, the natural instinct is to stamp upon palpitating hearts. So uh, palpitating heartism doesn't get you anywhere at all. It seems to me that one really needs to have two things. You want not only to be able to say don't, but you also want to be able to say do. To be able to stand up to any developer and say, friend, I know about the last time. Man, you really made a shambles. The house has slid down the hill. You've got a number of them here. And somebody sued you. You know, you don't want that to happen again. And the man says, I certainly don't. You say, well, you just come to me. I'll tell you where, you know. We've got, we've got this map. 
It'll tell you the areas where you can get the best of all possible foundations, where you can guarantee to have dry basements, where uh, indeed the, the recreational resources are inordinately attractive to prospective development. You and so you, you then are engaged in a positive inducement process in which developers are trooping in here, asking to find out places where development is most fitting for every function, be it an atomic power station or an airport or new town, doesn't matter what it is. But the only thing you can ask is nature. You live in the, the, that area where the ice sheets came and went, and they have left their mark. And so we've got to know about superficial geology, because they've modified historical geology. If you know about climate, historical geology, and physiography, and, and superficial geology, you know about physiography, because that just happens to be the current state of the world's surface as a result of these ongoing processes. If you know about climate, geology, bedrock geology, superficial geology, and physiography, then you know about hydrology. And if you know about the movements of water, then you know about soils. If you know about soils, then you can understand the distribution of plants. And if you know where plants are, then you know why animals are. Because, you know, uh, squirrels eat acorns and robins eat worms. And when we get to that point, we can introduce man. But man responds to these things in a causal way too. That is, he searched here for uh, river corridors and for the confluence of rivers and for agricultural hinterlands, which were made of inordinately productive soils, which are comprehensible in terms of physiography and hydrology and fluvial processes and is responsive to coal and to limestone and to iron and uranium and so on. All of which can be understood in terms of the litany of the progression which I have uh, identified. But it's not enough simply to identify it this way. We have to integrate it and that the integrating science of course is ecology which is a study of the interaction of organisms and an environment which environment includes other organisms. So that's what we did. All this natural process data enabled us to determine the suitability of the land for various prospective uses. For urbanization, we selected favorable conditions of slope and aspect and orientation and foundation conditions and soil drainage and amenity. And we avoided detrimental conditions like uh, floodplains and aquifer recharge areas. And so in various shades of red, we mapped urban suitability in a range of values. For agriculture, we selected conditions of soil intrinsic productivity physical properties, soil drainage, slopes, and so on, which represented primary agriculture and a range of values for agriculture in five grades. And we mapped this yellow. And we did the same thing for recreation by types, mapped in blue, and for protection, mapped in green. Here we identified all the lands where development would be a hazard to life or limb and the unique natural resources. Now, having identified these individual suitabilities, we had to arrange them in a hierarchy of importance. And we said, the category of protection preempts all other land uses. Now, this was judgment. Of course, society doesn't do this at the moment. As, as I've suggested, the obverse is true. They say, give us a floodplain. We love to build in a floodplain. How else can we get our names in the paper? And so there they get their names in the paper, and they happily accept the proposition of digging the mud out of the basement. I think the, f the first and most important proposition to make is that the, uh, the river owns a floodplain. It will occupy it, and there will be cycles of floods. I would, uh, if I had any power at all, insist that the 50-year floodplain, by definition, be not occupied by any residential development. Uh, the 100-year floodplain might. The 5-year floodplain, absolutely never. And then the area of protection is a very, very large one, and probably not a good word. Uh, I think you could think of it more, more in terms of intolerance of the environment. That is, if you think of a proposition that nature is doing a great deal of work for man without any human investment. The river is in fact a biological system, which is also a water purification system. Not because the organisms want to purify water, but because they want to eat. And they eat these wastes, which come from all these processes. So we can think then of disposal of these as feeding the river. We must do this, however, in relation to the capacity of the organisms to consume these wastes. And once we have done this, we can regulate all land uses in order to feed and maintain the river at one level of water quality. The cleanest water would be that supporting a crayfish, uh, not so clean a bass, dirty a catfish, and foul a flatworm. But I don't think there's a single sanitary engineer in the country who understands rivers as biological systems and uses this understanding as a basis for waste disposal. You might even think it a reasonable process to allow nature to do this very kind work for us for nothing. Rather than, of course, what we do at the moment, uh, say, where is this most, most valuable resource? Where is this process which is absolutely in essential to life? Let us screw it up with all joy. Oh, what an outrageously bad place for a dump. Of all the places to put a dump, this is clearly the worst. Floodplains are those areas which, by definition, are inundated by water. 
here it is, right in the floodplain, near floodplain ponds, adjacent to a river. Toxic or noxious materials in the dumps will, of course, make their way into the water and will affect water quality. And if you want to locate places for dumps or sanitary landfill or rubbish, one has got to be sure that these are not in aquifer recharges. Those areas where the greatest amount of percolation occurs from the surface down into the deep water, which is used for wells. We have to say then that all dumps constitute an enormous hazard to water quality and to health. So we set aside all these areas which should be protected. We then considered the highest categories of urbanization, of agriculture, and of recreation. And when we superimposed these maps, there were areas which were eminently suited for these particular uses. There was no conflict. We suggested these areas should be reserved for these uses. But there were other areas which were suited for several uses. And the people in the Minneapolis and Paul region have to resolve how they can have a creative mix of what land uses they prefer. And after we considered all the primary lands, we simply applied the same procedure to the lands of secondary and lower suitabilities. And so tediously and slowly, we mapped this fantasy. And remember that we didn't know the answer as we proceeded. But finally, we assembled all of this information, and there it was done. All right, so I know it's terribly tedious stuff, but, you know, you bought this, and here it is, and, you know, you have to understand it. Well, I was going to suggest that uh, we do accept your report with gratitude and enthusiasm, uh, Ian, and uh, direct our staff to make further review of this material for us and uh, then to proceed to make recommendations to this council with regard to the several programs that we have that uh, tie to this. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, my only requirement is that you accept this wholeheartedly and give your life over to this realization. That's a... The realization of these ideas is not going to be easy. Most people fail to understand that land which deserves protection is best protected by leaving it in its natural state. They tend to think that any open space ought to be developed into parks. When you provide parks, uh, you aren't just acquiring property, you're developing. Well, certainly you're going to have to have some type of a highway system to these areas. In, in using equipment to develop the parks, uh, you're building the roads, you're, you're, you're cutting down bluffs. Dear God. The land recommended for protection is likely to go down the drain unless the state creates a Metropolitan Open Space Commission empowered to implement the plan. A bill now before the Minnesota legislature would provide revenue, possibly from a hike in the cigarette tax, to compensate the local governments for property taken off their tax base and preserved. The commission would not have to purchase the land, simply the development rights to it. To implement the plan for the valleys may be simpler at least on a governmental level. Only Baltimore County is involved. But the problem of compensating those who will not be able to profit from development remains the same. There have been no zoning changes in Baltimore County for a good many years, and uh, with the help of this council and with the lead of the council, there is a new zoning ordinance being put through known as a plan unit district where you can take a group of say a hundred acres that formerly you'd have had to build X number of houses on each acre and accommodate more density on part of the acreage and leave open space to accommodate the uh, recreational areas that the people would should have and uh, will have. Well but eventually it's, it's hoped that those who own property in the higher areas of the, val of the valley area uh, will have agreements with those whose property is not to be uh, built upon, and that those whose property remains open would be compensated by the agreement with those who sell and on which houses will be built. Now to open our show, the beautiful Marl Lances Dancers. Even Lake Tahoe has set the stage for some action. For years, the five counties of California and Nevada which border Lake Tahoe have been running their own show, with no plan at all. The first move was to agree to a bi-state agency which would adopt a plan and have the power to keep everyone in line.
the current session of congress is likely to approve the taco regional planning agency its job will be to control development to preserve the beauty of the land and the clarity of the water these problems involve soil erosion and it is difficult to find native vegetation which will stabilize the soil of a road cut or a bulldozed ski hill. How seriously will the agency consider curbing development to prevent siltation from polluting the lake? If roads cannot be built without hastening pollution, will it limit highway construction? The agency will be staffed largely by the city and counties which have been responsible for the problems all along. Will this simply be a case of the mice guarding the cheese? Hawaii, a taste of paradise. But why just taste it? Why not move right in and own your own tropical bungalow? A few years ago, the desire to bail out to Hawaii was so great that unsuspecting souls were buying lots sight unseen in the middle of the lava fields. If this land speculation had continued unchecked, the burden on the county of Hawaii to provide police, fire, school, and road services would have brought financial disaster. Something had to be done to curb uncontrolled growth. And the day was fast coming when the jumbo jets would disgorge tourists by the millions. Hotels would be sprouting up in the pineapple fields. To preserve its economy and its beauty, the state in 1964 put into effect a land use law which withdrew from the county governments most of their power to zone land. Only Hawaii, even today, has state zoning on such a broad scale. Last fall, Alfred Heller took his conservationist group, California Tomorrow, to Hawaii to study how the land use law has worked. What we're seeing here from New Anapali is a, I think an excellent example of how Hawaii state land use law is working. We have, in a sense, preserved a great scenic area here and halted in its tracks a subdivision. We've halted it for four years. All the land which is unbuilt upon, the green land, the open spaces, are zone conservation. The conservation provisions do not allow subdivisions. The boundary line between the conservation district and the urban district is the edge of the subdivision that you see here. The conservation areas are the top of the hills, the valley below us in here, and the foothills beyond. Our job is somehow to make sure that in years to come we can hold this boundary here. Now, at the time we started to work on this, all this area was planned for subdivisions. I remember seeing the drawings all laid out in a beautiful grid system. So here we have an example where I, th I think Hawaii is really a pioneer in the nation that we preserved an area because of its scenic qualities, because it is beautiful. Legally, we have said we are going to zone it accordingly. One of the reasons for setting up the Land Use Commission and the land use law was to halt the gradual encroachment of urban uses, subdivisions, into the sugar and pineapple lands in central Oahu. The land is zoned agriculture by the state. It encourages agriculture in the areas which are most suitable for sugar and pineapple. The state zones all the land in, in Hawaii, public and private. Then within urban land, the county requirements uh, have higher priority. In other words, whether it shall be residential or industrial, whether it shall be hotel or uh, apartments. In Honolulu, one of the more popular places to live is St. Louis Heights. If the state had not placed what was left of them in the conservation zone, these hills would have been obliterated completely. It stopped development primarily to protect the Honolulu water supply, but also to preserve some vestiges of nature in the urban area. In the Santa Monica Mountains of Southern California, public safety is much more of a problem, and yet development continues virtually unchecked. Geologists consider the mountains a junk heap, inherently unstable, susceptible to mudslides and flooding, and less developed with extreme caution. The California Open Space Study recommended that half the undeveloped mountains be preserved for recreation. 
the city of Los Angeles has preferred to let developers tear the mountains apart and rebuild them so people could live in what the Department of Building and Safety once called their castles in the air. No accurate death count has been made for the floods this winter. Estimates range up to 101 dead in January alone. Well, look, uh, the, the sprawl of Los Angeles, the perennial failure of local government to protect the Santa Monica Mountains from urban development or from simply being cut away for some other purpose, the incursion of cities on our prime agricultural lands in the Santa Clara Valley, the sprawling, ugly growth in the great scenic areas of Lake Tahoe. All of these things could be forestalled in the future, stopped in their tracks, if California had the kind of land use law that Hawaii had. Yeah, I think that's true. State zoning is a marvelous conception. It could be used to perpetuate Santa, Santa Monica Mountains, uh, prime agricultural lands, in fact, uh, it's a device by which all intrinsic resources can be uh, perpetuated. It's a device of, it's a preservationist device of the, of the atmosphere value. Would it apply to all states, do you think? Oh, I think it should apply to all states. But, but the kinds of planning we're talking about, of course, have severe limitations when one penetrates into the heart of the city. We cannot really solve the problem of 300 million Americans in the year 2000 uh, invested in great uh, megalopolitan winds surrounding the seaboard, that uh, the doubling of population in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Los Angeles and so on uh, can be resolved by simple planning devices. There is no way in which architecture, landscape architecture, city and regional planning can resolve the problem of 30 million Americans living in the New York regional area. Where are you going to put them? Austin, the continent is empty. There are only 80% uh, of the population are living in 2% of the space. Uh, the continent is absolutely empty. There are mountain ranges, there are deserts, lakes, plateaus, uh, prairies that are the most glorious and gorgeous sites imaginable, uh, where we can build thousands and thousands of cities and sites of incomparable beauty, fulfilling the aspirations and dreams of Americans living and unborn. It's whole new metropolis. Oh, new metropolises, new cities, new villages, new hamlets. I mean, they, one could think of great glorious mountains uh, clad with snow and great coniferous forests and plateaus and mazes. I mean, one could think of Grey Wolf. What a glorious name for a new city. Grey Wolf. <laughs> Grey Wolf. You see, one day it's going to be possible to store all the information in computers and ask the computer to find any city we dream of to be able to ask it to find areas of inordinate beauty and intrinsic suitability for all the land uses that should compose the city, all the recreational delights and water and foundations and every other conceivable thing. And out of this glorious computer will print, print this marvelous map which will reveal just exactly that which we want to know. But this is still just a dream, Ian. How do we get from here to there? Well, I think the first and most important thing is to resolve to let people live where they want most to live, to offer an environment of choice. We can have a sample survey and ask people what, what are their dreams in terms of physical environment and take an ecological inventory of the entire country to find out what the land offers in, in, in terms of environmental choices and then match the choices of the people to the promises and opportunities of the land and from this mesh produce a new urban America, a, a, a new environment of choice. But people have to live in the big cities. That's where their jobs are. Well, the glorious thing about this is they don't. Uh, you see, all the cities we live in are products of the conception of bondage to toil. Industry chooses a site in the first place. Housing takes the next uh, option, and recreation has to take the residue. Now we can invert the whole situation. Whereas once industries had to be based near iron or coal or transportation, this is no longer true. We are now absolutely liberated from economic determinism. Well, what we're really talking about then is, is planning on a massive scale. Absolutely unimaginable scale. Uh, as different from the present as night and day. We must uh, think of analogies uh, more like the Marshall Plan 
or the whole passion which engaged nations in World War II. And the best analogy, of course, is the passion engaged this nation in the American Revolution. The revolution is incomplete. The physical environment that is a product of this great American dream is its worst indictment. It is not only necessary to, to achieve equity and justice, the emancipation of all men, but to make this vision clear in our cities and towns.